My name is Tyler Ralston and I am a professor of history. My specialty is Latin America. Okay. And how long have you been at the university? Seven years now. Wow, seven years. Came in with you? Or yeah. were you there a year before? I can't remember. I was probably about a half a semester before you were here. So. Okay. Wow, that's, that's... That's right. You came, you came in to sit on, in our orientation stuff, but it was clear that you'd been there just a little while. Yeah, so we're, we're more or less in the same cohort. Wow, that's great. So as a professor of history, when you were a kid, was that the goal as a kid, or what did you want to do as a kid? Never. Um, to be quite honest, I, I, I was never very career-oriented, not until my 30s, really. I was much more, I preferred to kind of follow my nose and live the bohemian life, which I did. Uh, I did went to school, I, I mean, obviously I got my degree in history. That's the thing, uh, history was always there. It was always there. From the minute I set foot into, onto the university till graduating with a PhD in history, I was always a history major, okay? Never strayed from it. It was just my area of interest. But I had no interest in, I just had no thoughts about uh, career or anything like that. It was much, uh, that, it was the 90s. It was a time you didn't really have to. I wouldn't recommend to young students today to follow the path I did. The times are just too different. But, again, after I graduated college, I went to Mexico and lived there for a long time. Taught English in Mexico at, for corporate executives, for, which paid a pretty decent fee. It, it, I could live in Mexico City for three years. And I, I, between that, I got a master's degree and all that. Just sort of just going from one step to another. But it was never, never a thought of what I was going to do or always a vague one. And then at one point, I, was, I think I was about 33 or so, at this point I'm living in Brazil, just a very fun bohemian lifestyle, which worked out. At some point, I realized, this can't go on. And so I decided, I've I got to get back to school. And I did, and I entered into the University of Arizona in a Latin American history uh, PhD program, switched my focus to Brazil from Mexico, from my master's program, and then got real serious. But it took a long time, okay? Hmm. And, I mean, that's, some people would listen to this and already be really jealous of your time in Mexico and Brazil and just the idea of kind of exploring your own interests or just allowing life to kind of take you where it's at. And, but I'm sure you felt a lot of pressure sometimes. People probably said, oh, what are you going to do and blah, 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 you know. But if you had space to really just dream, if money was not an option, mm -hmm. what would be your dream job? That's an interesting question, uh, and it's a, it's a tough question to answer. Um, I very much like what I'm doing, okay? But there, I, I guess I would explore other interests if it weren't about a paycheck. Probably more research, more writing, more music, okay? I would, I would certainly do more things like that. Uh, but I'm pretty happy with what I do. And you know, as you talked about already about some of your experiences, was there anything particular that really happened that spurred you on towards the real pursuit of history and, and deciding, like, I can make a career out of this? Well, I think I come by it naturally. My dad is a professor of English, and so I always grew up as a son of a professor, and I knew lots of his friends, other professors and stuff, so it was always a lifestyle I was familiar with, and the one that I liked. Uh, summers off is always a good selling point, which now ends up being that's the time you get your own work done. Uh, but again, it, it was it's a good lifestyle. Um, not to, not because of the time off necessarily, but being able to do what you love to do is a rare treat in this modern world today. And I always have to remember that, as annoying as things can get sometimes. You know, every job's got its annoyances, but it's it's a pretty good place, and it's a pretty good gig. But I'm sorry, there was another part of that question. No, it was just this idea of if anything in life happened to spur you on towards the history route. No, that was just always my area of interest. Uh, my grandfather had a knack for it, and I, I think I picked it up from him. I, I just followed my nose. I became a history major because I loved it. Didn't, didn't question it. At one point I flirted with psychology, but no, I'd, I always just stayed with history. Uh, without much thought. There was not a lot of thought that went into it. It was just my natural area and I didn't question that. And it is. It is my natural area. Mm -hmm. So when you think about your own life, and I know it's hard to try to condense things down when we talk about a whole life, 
but if you today if you were asked about your call or purpose and trying to put it into a sentence what is your call or purpose well as a historian the way I would see my call or purpose is to in terms of students help them to understand history and that they're part of it I think a big mistake a lot of, especially a lot of young Americans make, is they think they're outside of history. It, uh, American exceptionalism and all that takes it to that level. And it's like, no, 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 you're part of a big process. You're part of a lot of secular processes, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that would be the way I would approach that. It's like, no, you're part of this. And, you know, you came from somewhere, you're going somewhere. And you don't get to just look at this as a trivial thing. Okay, history is not trivial. Uh, you know, it's very much alive. Okay, the past is, as Faulkner said, the, you know, the past is is not dead. It's not even the past, and that's an interesting way to look at it. Okay, lots of interesting ways to look at it. Mm -hmm. So, when you think about your your call and purpose, this is probably a, a mute point, but do you feel like your current job or career aligns with your call and purpose? Yeah good enough. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay. Um, so obviously as a professor you have conversations with students, you um, have made meaningful impressions on students, but who for you in your world has been most influential to really help you understand your own design or your own sense of passion and your own interests? Okay, interesting question. Uh, lots of influences from all over the place, but if I had to pick a couple, my father, first of all, again, uh, never, never pushed, but always guided through all of this, okay, especially the academic stuff. Um, but if I were to, a moment, say, that had a big impact, at the time it did, but for different reasons, but stuck with me. Uh, I had a professor once at West Virginia University. It was an Irish history class, or Celtic history. Um, and the guy was a total eccentric. Every other word out of his mouth was the F-bomb, okay? It was, and that's not why it, he was good. That was, it, that was fascinating enough as an undergrad. But it, he demanded a lot of students. And at one point, his test consisted of just do something, do something creative, Give it to me. I want to. His, his thing. I want to be entertained. So what I decided to do. I was completely lazy. I was a very lazy student early on. I just. I said, all right. I'm going to write a letter from some you know, some some per some Celtic person living in Ireland, and it's written to a, a member of the royal family or something. I can't even remember what it was. Something along those lines. But it was so half-assed. It was like four lines long, and it just came back with a big fat F on it. And so I was shocked. For, I mean, why one is shocked at something like that, I don't know. But again, being a naive 20-year-old or 19-year-old or whatever. So I got that F on the Friday before spring break. I carried it with me the entire week. And the first thing in the following week, I went to see that professor and sat down with him. And all he said, all the only comments on it were, not much here. And he sat down with me. He said, look, if you don't bring these people to life, they're dead forever. Okay, all these historical people we talk about in the abstract, if you don't bring it to life, if you don't use your creativity and imagination, they're dead forever. There's no point in taking any of these classes. So why don't you give me something interesting? So I rewrote the thing with, it, it kind of, it was, a, it was a watershed moment. And then I realized, geez, I used to be a creative person. Somehow that had been stifled along the way. So he, he it's like drew it out again. And so I rewrote the thing and got a B on it. Okay, it wasn't great, but it was a start. And that stuck with me ever since. I call that the F that changed my life. Okay, because it was. Okay, it's, you, you know, think about what you're doing and why you're doing it, or don't waste your time. Mm. That, that's a powerful line. The idea of just being mindful of what you're doing. It's not easy, uh, especially for certain personalities that aren't career driven like I wasn't. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of seeking adventure and stuff, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But I would say if you're going to seek adventure, do it with purpose. That's, what, that's advice I would give for anyone who wanted to do anything like that.
have a have a bigger goal in mind. Don't just drift from pillar to post. Well, you're in a discipline that has been in a group of disciplines kind of under attack because you can't go work in the history factory or you can't get the history, you know. And so if people are watching this and here you are representing a discipline that maybe doesn't automatically always equate to an instant job, you know, in the field when you get out of college, why why would a person pursue history? That's a very good question. And if you are interested in getting a job just out of undergrad with a history degree, yes, you're going to have certain advantages. Um, basically, you're trained to think critically. And we don't sell ourselves enough on this as a uh, discipline, but a lot of people actually look for history majors just right out of the box. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's very minor. Uh, again, not being a job-oriented person myself. Just be prepared if you want a career in history, you're going to have to get in for the long haul. And I don't, I would certainly never dissuade anyone from doing that, but be prepared, it's a rough road ahead. It won't be, someone like, the level of student I was in those days wouldn't cut it now. You'd have to be more serious up front. Um, I, I happened to be at a time and there was lots of room for play, let's just say. I would say to get serious right off the bat now, if that's what you want to do. But it's a perfect, it's, it's, a, it's a noble direction and it's not for everybody, okay? You're kind of an elitism historian. It's not, the, it's, it's not going to be elite in terms of economics. Mm -hmm. So if someone's watching this today and they see your kind of maybe a, a little bit more open of a schedule and they see your passions, like the drums behind you and they hear your passion about music or in, in history and they say, wow, like you're living the life I want. This is exceptional, you know? What did you do to put yourself in this position? Well, basically, again, uh, a lot of it just came together. I mean, living in Mexico for years, I learned Spanish. Living in Brazil, I learned Portuguese. So going into a program for Latin American history, I had a lot of advantages without actually trying to acquire them, so to speak. Um, so again, there was, it's a certain amount of, again, I recommend to follow one's nose. Follow your own interests and just keep going with them. Even if it's not going to get you that, whatever job you get right out of undergrad is going to be probably not what you're interested in anyway. But just keep in mind any young people that are think, have some distant goal that you think, uh, one student I have is really interested in forensic anthropology. Okay, and he's a bright young man. And what I tell him is, hey, look. You know, it, it, from his point of view, it's sort of like it's an impossible bridge, just from his own upbringing or whatever. Um, or it's, or it's, it's kind of like a, it's, that's something other people do. Uh, and I said, look, someone does that job. Why can't it be you? Why wouldn't it be you? Just figure out what's between here and there, and then step one, step two, step three, and then take those steps if that's what you want to do, if you're career-oriented career -oriented like that. Just, you can make it happen. Just be aware it's not going to be easy. You'll have to make some pretty hefty sacrifices along the way, and it might get a little scary, especially with debt. And that's, there's good reason to be scared about that. Mm. So, you even talk about your own journey as a student and maybe receiving that F at 20 and just having not really, you have some passions, but just really there's no sense of like, clear direction. Definitely not. So yeah. many students are in that in that space. You know, even when they graduate with a major, it's still like, I just don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. So what advice do you have for students who, who maybe just really feel like they just have no idea about their call or purpose? Follow your nose. I think a lot of times the confusion comes from expectations that they should be doing this or should be doing that. Follow your nose, and you, I think you, you figure out where you want to go pretty quickly. 